everybody wanna be black Until it's time to file them taxes Until it's time to walk into the job interview And your skin color don't grant access Damn, everybody wanna be black We athletic, make cool dances But everybody tell the black man Be quiet when he's strong and he take tough stances Everybody wanna be black When you're black, you influence everything in the coach Hi, my name is Dr. Jamal Lawrence, and I'm the founder and CEO of Harvest Health MD, a direct primary care medical practice. For those of you unfamiliar with direct primary care, it works similar to Netflix or Hulu. My patients pay me a low monthly fee, and that gives them unlimited access to their doctor. Telehealth, same day, next day visits, no wait times, all for that same low monthly fee. Direct primary care is the future of medicine. I believe in this so much so that instead of taking the big doctor paycheck, I forewent all of that and started my own practice from scratch. Direct Primary Care and Harvest Health MD is focusing on high quality, cost effective health care, putting the patient and the doctor back at the forefront of medicine. Hi, you living family. This is Linton Hester with Council for the Culture. This is a special episode where we're going to be talking about health care and mental health. So in episode four, I want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for joining and watching. We don't want you just to be on, but we want you to be in on the conversation and the discussion that is going to bring valuable information to you as a viewer and the audience listener. With that in mind, we have a few housekeeping notes. If you are just tuning in as a new viewer, we want to say thank you for being a part of Counseling for the Culture podcast show. And if you are here, please go ahead, hit a like, a share, and also tag someone who you know may need this information that is going to bring a wealth of knowledge and information to help empower them in their daily life. Monday Monday is actually designed to help individuals, especially men for the month of June, because this is National Men's Health away from Juneteenth and also past Father's Day, we want to really focus on men. And so with that, we want to make sure that you get a chance to tag every man you know, every man that you may be familiar with, who will be able to bring themselves to the knowledge that we're about to give you on tonight with our special guest. So in the comment, if you can go ahead and type in, I'm in, to let us know that you're here, that you're present, and that you are ready for great information that will come across your ears and your eyes. Also, I want to also mention that there is also National Minority Health Month coming up in July. I don't want to forget that. I want to make sure that we give a chance to recognize that and to be prepared because we have more information and more details coming regarding that particular topic of minority mental health month. And so without further ado, I want to also introduce and give way to talk about our special guest for this evening. We have Dr. Jamal Lawrence, who is a double board certified family medicine and lifestyle medicine physician. He is also the founder and CEO of Harvest Health MD. Throughout his education and training, Dr. Lawrence has held numerous leadership positions in various organizations. This also includes Minority Association of Pre-Medical Students, or MAPS, the Students National Medical Association, SNMA, and the American Academy of Family Physicians, Primary Care Leadership Collaborative. With that in mind, we also want to make sure that we include that he is also the first DPC office black owned here in Savannah. And we're going to get into the acrostic of DPC and we're going to talk about all of the passion and things that he has to to share with us. And I want to also include this. Dr. Lawrence is a New York native who graduated from State University of New York and Bemington with a BA in biological sciences and a minor in sociology. A year after graduating, Dr. Lawrence attended Indiana University School of Medicine and later completed his training at the Savannah Family Medicine Residency Program at Memorial Health in Savannah, Georgia. So if you are here, if you are present, again, make sure you put a comment in the comment section to let us know that you are watching live. If you are a returning viewer, we know that we have information that you care about that's valuable to you and that you find to be applicable to your life. Now, I want to also include that 
If you have any questions, make sure that you post those questions. Get involved in the comments because this segment is a segment for you. If you have questions about things you need to know regarding visiting physicians, things about health issues, challenges, and all of these other topics that we're going to talk about, comorbidity and disparities and a lot of other things that are very important. We want to make sure that you are in and that you are present. We have someone who's already excited for the interview. I'm excited myself. I've been waiting all month long to get Dr. Lawrence to be seated on the show. And I know that he is going to be a valuable asset to us as we see that he has a list. And I mean, it is a an, an immaculate list of all of the things that he's contributed to things that he has provided himself to and that he has helped along the way, those who have been in his care. So with that, I want to make sure that we do some housekeeping notes. If you have questions, we are going to answer any questions towards the end of the interview. And there will be some questions that we ask during the segment that we want to make sure that you get answered. And we will provide all of the details and information to you once we get involved in the discussion. So don't be shy, don't be ashamed. Grab your uncle, grab your father, grab your nephew, your brother, grab your aunts, whoever you have next to you. And if you're watching from your sofa, if you're watching from your device, from the car, from home, from your laptop or the rooftop, make sure that you get a chance to just get in on the discussion because we want to hear from you and we want to make sure that we answer the questions that are important to you. And so now at this part of the segment, we're going to bring to the forefront, if we have Dr. Lawrence available, we're going to bring Dr. Lawrence out so that he will be able to get in on the discussion. So for those of you who are just now joining us, we're bringing out our great special guest, Dr. Jamal Lawrence. Hello, Hello. Jamal. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, thank you for joining us. We are so glad to have you on the show. We know that this discussion is going to be something great, and it's going to be a great informational topic that includes empowerment and all of the insight, because I want to pick your brain. I just want to pick your brain. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so one of the things I wanted to, to ask you, Dr. Lawrence, is, I, you know, I, I followed you on Facebook. I followed you on Instagram, and I got to say, you know, affectionately that I fell in love with your mission. You know, I, I know that you're here to serve. You're here to be a, a, a contributing factor and to see change. And, and I just read through your website and I love your language. I mean, your language is just very personable. And so I think that tells a lot about the service you provide and the heart that you have for people. And when I saw the fact that I, I got a chance to see your post and it talked about DPC, can you tell us what DPC mean and the passion that you have behind DPC? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that question. And just first and foremost, thank you for having me. Um, I was looking forward to getting on this uh, this podcast as well, just to kind of discuss with you um, some of the topics that you know are near and dear to my heart. Um, it's always you know uh, good vibes when you have a black doctor and a black therapist in the same room discussing you know health issues that affect the black community. So um, thank you for having me. Uh, direct primary care. Uh, what it is, is essentially a model of medicine. And so I'm a primary care doctor, uh, family medicine board certified as well as lifestyle medicine. And instead of going the traditional route and going fee for service and dealing with insurance, um, I decided that that wasn't the way for me um, for personal reasons with regard to the type of father I wanted to be, the type of husband I wanted to be, the presence I wanted to have in my family life. But then also for the more important thing specifically to uh, medicine for my patients. Um, medical care in this country is quite challenging these days. Um, it's unaffordable. Uh, it is inconvenient. It is astronomical when it comes to pricing. Uh, and it's just not a very good experience. And when I learned about direct primary care as an alternative model to practicing in the traditional fee for service, um, I quickly fell in love with it, understanding that that was a mission, uh, model that was more aligned with my mission, my values, and how I dreamed of taking care of patients um, when I first decided that I wanted to become a doctor. 
Uh, direct primary care, what it essentially does, uh, it means that the care is direct. You cut out insurance companies and remove them from the equation, and the doctor and the patient is at the forefront of the relationship. And so I'm working directly for my patients. They pay the practice a monthly membership fee, a subscription kind of model, kind of like Netflix, and that gives them essentially unlimited access to primary care. So we're talking about urgent care, we're saying wellness visits, we're talking about you know acute visits, we're talking telehealth. Uh, my patients email me, they get phone calls, we do virtual chats, and all of this stuff is included in their monthly membership fee. They call me three times a month, same fee. They call me once, same fee. Um, in addition to that, the other fringe benefits for direct primary care is essentially low cost near wholesale labs. Um, low cost near wholesale imaging and reduce pricing on medications. And so I'm not the only one practicing this in this particular area, though I am the first black physician and the only male physician practicing in this model. Um, we essentially seek to remove insurance from the equation, focus on the patient, give high quality, very personalized, very convenient and cost effective primary care uh, with the focus on the being, like I said, on the patient and not the insurance incumbent, incumbents when it comes to uh, medicine these days. Wow. And so is this a new model or is this something that has been around for years or how, 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 how early or how late or how long has this been modeled? Um, if it's been out there for a long, how long has this been modeled? So that's a good, that's a good question. Um, thank you for that question. That, um, that's, it's kind of interesting, right? So like, yes and no. Um, you know, some people will describe it as a new school twist to old school medicine. Um, so before insurance got in the game, and really, you know, insurance has only really been um, managing healthcare or being a third-party payer for healthcare uh, for maybe the last since like, the middle of the, the 20th century, uh, maybe a little bit before that. Um, and so before that, just like any other market, you went and somebody provided a service and you paid them, and that was how you received care. Just like you go to the mechanic, you pay the mechanic, he does a service for you, you leave. And somewhere um, mid 20th century, um, insurance has kind of started creeping into the equation. And so that essentially put another party between the patient and the doctor. And so when you see that um, there's another party involved, what usually happens when you have somebody in between the person who's providing the service, the person receiving the service, is cost inflation, is administration, is bureaucracy. And so that kind of came into the picture and kind of clouded what healthcare is today. And, um, and so looking around the landscape, this type of model is kind of getting back to the roots of what medicine was. So in that way, it's old school, um, but it's new in the sense that for what our generation is used to, everybody just assumes that, you know, you have insurance and if you don't have insurance, you can't see a doctor, you can't get healthcare. And, and that's actually not true. And so in, in that way, with the current model, this is a healthcare innovation in that it's giving people the opportunity to see a doctor, um, get personal care, get high quality care, get convenient care, and have it not necessarily tied to employment, which is really important because some people, you know, may not have a job but still can afford the average national fee, which is somewhere around seventy to eighty dollars a month. Um, and it also allows for people who may be making a little bit of money. Um, in our practice, we focus on small business owners as well, um, who might make enough to you know, pay the bills, but not necessarily enough to afford $800, $900 a month per person for an insurance plan. Well, then this becomes a very viable option um, in terms of bringing access to people who traditionally would not have access to home care. That's great. And so w with that model, how responsive are your existing clients to having this type of model that's convenient, that's cost effective, and that seems to be very personable with the one-on-one -on -one interaction that they have with you? I'm sorry, I said the beginning of that question again? How, how responsive are your existing clients to knowing that they have the, the benefit mm -hmm. and access to you? Uh, for the patients that I have, they're very responsive. Um, the challenge really is the education piece. And it's getting people to understand outside of health insurance that there's options. There are options, rather, for health care. Um, once people understand how it works, understand that they come to the office and spend less money than they ever thought they would and actually receive a more personalized experience, uh, 
it's an it's at that point that you don't have to sell it. It, it just makes sense. Um, it feels better, uh, and you get the healthcare that you, you really want. Um, and so with that, patients are are very receptive. But I find the biggest thing is just education, getting patients, getting the word out there that there is an option. And one of the things that I found in healthcare that I, I like to talk about a lot is uh, three tenants. People don't think that if people think that if they don't have insurance, they can't receive health care. And that's a fallacy. Um, another fallacy is that people think that because they do have insurance, that they will have access to health care. So they think I, I pay insurance every month. And so when I need it, it's going to work. And for a lot of people, that's not the case. A lot of people, when they're really depending on insurance, they get these hidden fees, they get these astronomical bills. Um, 66% of bankruptcy in this country is due to medical debt. And so that just gives you an idea of what you're really dealing with. And then the last fallacy is that health insurance and health care are not synonymous. They're not the same thing. They're not synonymous. Health care is the service that you receive and the quality of service that you receive. Um, health insurance is the is what you pay for to help insure against catastrophe, major illness and things of that nature. Well, I never knew that. I never would have. I'm not in that industry, so I don't I don't know. And that is that is really outstanding and astounding, I'll say, to to get this information, because most people, even when I call my insurance provider, right, one of the one of the things that I hear a message I hear is like not all insurance, not all medical expenses are actually covered under your insurance. Absolutely. And I'm like, wait a minute, but I'm paying a thousand, twelve hundred, fifteen hundred dollars a month for insurance to be cared for. And all of a sudden when I go and get treated, oh, I'm sorry, we're not covering this. Yeah. So it's like you have to kind of really try to find ways to exfoliate the fine print because it's not right there in front of you. Absolutely. And that, you know, that can be discouraging because, you know, you're forking over all of this money coming out of your paycheck every month. And then all of a sudden, you know, if you have a procedure or some some medical condition that need attention, then you're disappointed because not all, you know, services are covered under insurance. And so this is groundbreaking information to me. Yeah. And that's usually when people end up finding me when they <laughs> when they're kind of pissed off about their insurance, the experience that they've had. Um, and that's one of the things. And, and it, you know, for us to say that, you know, we remove insurance from the equation, uh, I just have to, you know, put the caveat in. It doesn't mean that insurance is bad necessarily. Um, we don't think that in direct primary care world. It's more so insurance is good when used in the proper context. And so if you think about insurance and how it works, uh, insurance is a hedge against catastrophic risk. So, like, for example, if you look at your house insurance, you pay that every month, but you hope to never use it. Because if you use it, your house probably burned down, there's water damage, like something really bad happened. And those prices are going to, the cost is going to be so high that you could go bankrupt. And so that's when insurance kicks in and covers those high costs. But for general maintenance, like changing your roof, like putting in new flooring, like remodeling, you don't use insurance for that. You pay for that um, and you, you know, plan and you pay for it accordingly. Uh, in healthcare, it's one of the only places I know where we use insurance to almost do like a prepaid model. I'm going to pay you, pay you every month, and then when I need something, I'm going to use it. And if we use insurance more like for catastrophic coverage, so if I have a surgery, if I get diagnosed with cancer, God forbid, I get into a major accident, life or limb threatening, uh, hospitalizations, those bills are really, really high. And you definitely want to have some kind of insurance plan for that. Um, but for routine maintenance, you know, a wellness visit, you know, urgent care visit, cough, cold, the sniffles, insurance shouldn't necessarily have to, you know, be in the middle of that. And so I say all that to say, um, when used in the proper context, I think it's a good thing. And I just want to signpost that with I'm not a insurance broker or a health, uh, uh, health insurance advocate. And so you should talk to your you know, specific broker about your insurance plan. Um, but that's how we see in the direct primary care space. Uh, it working well with insurance. And, and for context, about half the patients in my practice have insurance and about half don't. Wow. Okay. Wow. That's great information. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. And, and, and I, I want to segue to ask regarding men, because I know this is Men Day Monday. Yeah. And I know that many men, and especially this being 
the National Health Awareness Month for men, many men that I come in contact with, you know, primarily me, I stay away from the doctor. And the reason why, <laughs> the reason why I do that is not because I have to come out of pocket to pay for co copays and things like that. It's because I would say it's because I'm afraid of what some of the responses will be from the doctor. They may tell me something I don't want to hear. Yeah. You know, they may end up having me go through certain procedures and referring me to different things that that and that can be scarce. And so with this being National Men's Health Month, what would you say are some of the primary things men should look for when they go to the doctor? And say, for instance, they come in, they step to you and they want to go through screenings. What are some of the things that they need to be looking for? Are you talking about in terms of what kind of medical screening should they look for in terms of their experience with, with the primary care doctor or the doctor? With, with, with screenings. With screenings. Uh, and so, uh, you know, kind of general screenings, there's not necessarily um, that many screenings that come out of the context of what, you know, both male and females should have during a physical exam. Uh, one of the big things obviously is going to be prostate. And so that typically starts at age 55. Um, unless you have an increased risk factors, increased factors would be, you know, um, African-American descent, um, elderly age, um, smoking is always a risk factor for all kinds of cancer and all cause mortality in general. Um, so those are kind of some of, the, some of the kind of things that you want to, family history as well. I'm not sure if I said that, but that's also a major risk factor. And so those, particularly with first degree relatives, so like if your father had it or something like that, um, those are one of the major things you want to look for. Um, Outside of that, uh, you know, triple abdominal aortic aneurysm screening for men uh, over 65, I believe, who have smoked um, in their past for at least 15 years or so um, and are currently still smoking or quit after or within the last 10 years or so. And so that is the thing that makes us distinct because those men have a higher rate of aortic abdominal aneurysms. And what an aneurysm is essentially your aorta is the major blood vessel that comes out of your heart and that feeds your body with oxygen. And sometimes mm -hmm. uh, the wall of that blood vessel can dilate and kind of bowl up like a balloon. And if the pressure is too high, meaning your blood pressure is not controlled and other you know, factors that affect that smoking, um, you can essentially have a rupture and blood will leak out into your chest cavity. And that's a medical emergency and a high risk of death. So that would be another thing that men should look out for. Um, but in general, by and large, somewhere around age mid 30s to 40s, the typical things that you're likely going to go to the doctor for, which is going to be diabetes, which is going to be cholesterol issues, which is going to be screening for hypertension, which should start actually a lot younger, and particularly for black males, um, should start, um, you know, preteens, if not. Everybody typically starts around 18, but the reality is that, you know, 40% of black men over the age of 20 have high blood pressure. And so when you're getting into numbers like that, you start to look at, you know, what we're doing, the culture of how we eat, the culture of our health, our ideas around health. And you start to look at, okay, maybe we need to start looking at other types of screening, colorectal cancer. It used to be at age 50, you get a colonoscopy. They actually move that down to age 45. And so other things to look for is if you have a first degree relative. So your mom, your dad, or grandparents, you know, and they've had colon cancer, you should be screening earlier than 45, actually. Um, we tend to screen first-degree relatives, people who have, who have first-degree relatives above that age. Um, we screen them 10 years earlier to reduce the risk of them having colon cancer. So those are some of the common uh, things that we screen for. Um, of note, because I recently was a keynote speaker um, on a Black Men's Health Summit, um, one thing that I'm finding, and I, wanna, I just want to highlight, um, particularly to your point with the question. Let's stay on the trend of hypertension, high blood pressure. Between the ages of 18 and 34, our risk compared to a white male is only about a 2% difference, which is like not really significant statistically. Between the ages of 35 to about 45, 50, our risk of blood pressure comparatively increases by 10%. And after 50, it increases by 20, 22%. And so I share that to say, you know, you're saying men are coming in and they're uncomfortable and they're not sure. 
you know, when they should get screening and maybe they're avoiding these things because they're nervous, they're scared, they don't want to be vulnerable, um, maybe they just don't like their doctor. Um, at the ages of 35 to, and, and beyond, your risk increases significantly. And so if I can catch you before 35, you come to my office at 30, and, you know, you're running around here and maybe you, you're eating a little bit too much and, um, you know, not taking care of yourself, you might can nip it in the bud and prevent. When you come in and you wait till you're 38, 40, 45, and a 15-year time span of bad habits, exactly what you said happens. Your ability, our ability to offer you options becomes limited. And now it's here, take this medicine, take this pill. Um, and most, if I had a dollar for every person that came to my practice and said, I don't want to be on medicine, you know, I, I probably wouldn't need to be a doctor anymore. Um, but the reality is, um, if you want to not be on medication for the rest of your life, and this is my personal um, view and has more to do with my lifestyle medicine certification. If you want to not be on medication for your life, you know, you need to come in earlier and try to prevent these things from happening because we have an increased risk of these things happening to us. Wow. So, and, and, and I also want to add to, do, do, do you believe that the reason why the stress and the increase in the rate compared to other groups, community groups, do you think that's due to certain uh, social factors, social economic factors, environmental factors, the reason why this, this you know, stress and blood pressure and hypertension is rampant? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so in the context of so this, this topic kind of trends a little bit into what we call social determinants of health uh, mm -hmm. in the terms of health equity. And so just kind of giving a, a broader view for people who are not familiar, uh, health disparities is desperate care, meaning uh, two groups come in, have all the same risk factors, one group gets better care than the other group. Why is that? Why is there a difference, a disparate in, in the care that they're receiving? Social determinants of health is basically, these are the things that will affect your health that have little to do with the medication, the thing that I'm going to do for you in the exam room. And those things are going to be, you know, is your environment safe for you to go out and exercise? You know, what kinds of things uh, or foods are you putting in your body? Um, do you have access to healthy foods in terms of do you live in a food desert or not? You know, is there a Whole Foods by you or is it only a convenience store and fast food? You know, do you have education uh, that gives you upward mobility? Do you, are you gainfully employed? And then when you get into more of the lifestyles things, those are, you know, are you avoiding risky substances? Do you smoke? Do you drink? Are you sexually active and using protection? Um, those things actually make up the bulk of care. And when you look down and you break down the percentages, only about 20% of your actual impact in care comes from the doctor. Meaning you walk in my office, I prescribe you medication, I check your blood pressure, and we have a conversation, I get you to change your life. Only 20% of that is really what impacts your health. The other 80% is all the things I just mentioned. Your lifestyle, stress, nutrition, exercise, sleep, social mm -hmm. connection, and, you know, employment, jobs, education, physical environment. Wow. That, that is amazing because I, I you know, I, it, when I'm working with some of my clients, you know, a lot of them go through those somatic issues where they have these, these physical ailments and they have headaches, you know, and, and, and in most cases, when I see these clients, they are struggling with depression. Um, and some of those precipitating factors uh, come from, as you mentioned, you know, it's environmental. Um, yeah. It's some of the, the, the work relationships, those social circles and the, those interrelations um, of those social factors actually impact them physically, mm -hmm. emotionally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it causes some some bouts of depression, anxiety. And uh, and that's why, you know, I think that having that that discourse and seeing a client from a holistic perspective helps to kind of bring some kind of res not necessarily resolution, but some management for them to be able to kind of find ways to manage their lives. Absolutely. To that point, um, there was a recent article that came out and I actually did a presentation on this for uh, term. They went and looked at mental health um, and they evaluated the, the impact of your 
the people in your workplace, the managers. And what they found is that your managers actually have a higher impact on your mental health than your doctor does. And so the reality comes to when you're in these toxic environments, and this is not a license for everybody to go quit their job, um, but it's challenging. But when you're in, you know, toxic environments that are affecting your mental health, that are causing you to be unnecessarily anxious, uh, unnecessarily depressed, dreading work, those kinds of things, uh, you have to kind of look internally and see, you know, what kind of things or what kind of mechanisms you have in place to help manage your emotions. But when you've done all the things that you can do, getting the appropriate sleep, starting an exercise plan, because exercise has been shown to reduce anxiety and depression, eating uh, less fast foods and ultra-refined processed foods, because diets with high processed foods, sugars, all those things have shown to increase depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. When you're doing the things that you can do and your environment is still causing you to have these issues, then you really need to think about the people that you're surrounded with, what this work environment looks like, and how is it going to impact your health for the better or worse, wow. depending on the circumstance. Wow, that's that's great. Um, because and this is one thing I realized with working with some of the clients on on my end is that when they experience those, you know, we call them invisible infirmities, because, you know, you, the, the, the emotional, yeah. the psychological, right, those things that they can't see. Um, in, in most cases, some of them look for, you know, just a therapist to try and work through some of those some of those psychological challenges, the damages, and, and even possibly trauma. Um, and so, what? I, and I just want to pick your brain. What are your thoughts on that holistic approach with marrying the a psychiatrist, psychologist, a clinician to to a a physician and finding ways to to help with that client working through those problems is it is it and i'll say this yeah just yeah. to simplify do you think it's more physical or do you think it's more more psychological or is it just the fact that it is a comorbidity um so those just the two parts because that's a good question um sorry <laughs> no no that's, that's good um and so first part what do i think about it i absolutely think that it's uh necessary and kind of when we are in the hospitals and when we're approaching care, what we call that is interdisciplinary care, meaning you have a nutritionist, you have a psychologist, you have a psychiatrist, you have the physical therapist, you have the pharmacist, um, you have the physician MD, and all these people are looking at your care from different angles and trying to put together a comprehensive treatment plan uh, that can be the best for the patient. Uh, that's kind of how I was trained. That's how medicine kind of functions today in teams. Uh, but when you start to get into the insurance scheme and you get into this current medical practice in this future service world, care tends to be very fragmented and asynchronous. You go here and then you have to wait X amount of weeks to see this other person and can you actually get in and then how much does that actually cost? And, you know, the specialist booked out six months. Well, I got a problem now. What do you do about that? Mm -hmm. um, but to that point, that's actually something that I want to institute within my practice, um, bringing in, you know, therapists, psychologists, you know, psychiatrists, um, and interdisciplinary and other uh, medical professionals to help aid in combining uh, or delivering a treatment plan that is very effective, um, kind of underpinning that the whole idea of my practice, Harvest Health MD, is, you know, we take care of patients both physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And, you know, it's as tangible as today. I had a conversation with one of my patients um, about, as a, as a black man, um, about their responsibility to be the leader in their home when it comes to spirituality and their care. So he asked me a very like a spiritual question. And I was just like, all right, let me take the MD hat off and, and really talk to you. Um, but you know, it, it's it's about you know focusing on that spiritual aspect because you know the spiritual aspect, the mental emotional aspect, um, those significantly impact care. And as you phrase it, the you know the invisible comorbidities. Uh, uh, <laughs> Those are the things that oftentimes have the most effect on us, but we're, we pay less attention to it because other people can't see it. Mm. Um, and, and so you, you really want to be able to treat those things, um, you know, to get the care that you need, to get professional help when warranted. And then to that same extent, um, there is evidence that there are psychosomatic connections, right? So mm. you can think yourself sick. You can, you know, have so much anxiety to the point where you start having heart palpitations and your cortisol level stress hormone is increasing in your body and now you have 
chronically high blood pressure, and that will mess with your metabolism, which can affect how you control blood sugars. And you see it affects all parts of the body. And so when we're giving you medicine and insulin for blood sugar and we're treating you from blood pressure, we also need to pay attention to how are you processing mentally, emotionally. And that's actually something I talk with my patients a lot about. Um, interestingly enough, um, for black men, there are, let's see, the U.S. population for African Americans is about 13.6%. Uh, black men make up about 48% of that. And I actually just ran the numbers today, comparatively to the you know, population of black men in the black community in the United States. I have about 28% of my practice is full of, of black men. So I was thought about that, like one of my goals would be to close it up to about 48% to make it reflect, you know, mm. the um, because we need that. I, and, and, and it is important because, you know, and, and I know we had this discussion before about the percentage of, you know, doctors and clinicians and that yeah. there are, you know, we're basically unicorns. Yeah. And, and I think that that representation is important. Um, and even, you know, I remember you, you mentioned um, that certain counties based on this article was saying that African-American families, you know, life expectancy uh, increases or so because of having a black physician or African-American physician in, in, in the same city. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, yeah, that's a good point. There's a couple of articles that have been really eye-opening um, receiving care. Um, that article that you mentioned, basically black county with more black doctors, black people live longer. That's one. Um, there has been studies that shown that people who have black doctors tend to get more screenings, tend to be more compliant, actually following the treatment plan tend to have a better healthcare experience. So experiencing less implicit and explicit bias, not, not being concerned that you're not getting the appropriate treatment because of the color of your skin. Um, in terms of compliance with treatment plan, being able to have a professional that has cultural uh, humility and competence, understanding that we walk similar walks in life. You know, um, one of my patients, when I'm talking to a black male, telling him the importance of, of getting a screening a lot easier for me because I go, look, we live on average four years less than every other racial group and gender, barring any. We are averaging about 60 years, 60, 60 years of life. So when you work all those years and you're ready to collect Social Security, you die before that and, and your prospects are limited. Um, when you have that conversation with somebody that looks like you, it hits a little bit different. That does. That does make it. And, and, I'm, and, and uh, just to <laughs> to add to that, usually, I, you know, I, I do work with some some young African-American boys and, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're shocked when they see me. They're like a black therapist. You know, yeah. it, it, it makes a difference because of that cultural competence and the language that comes with it, um, you know, because you, you're able to to remove that line and yeah. to kind of blur that line to be able to have that relativity and say, hey, I'm just like you. Yeah. We're included in this. Yeah. You know, we, we have to look out for one another and I'm looking out for you in this light. So I, I think it is it is, you know, really paramount that, you know, there are, you know, a growing number of African Americans, clinicians who are who are also, you know, psychiatrists and physicians such as yourself to 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 have that visibility so that they will know that you know the, the group even here locally in savannah and, and abroad will know that you know you don't have to you, you don't have to suffer in silence you don't have to amputate part of yourself when you go inside the doctor's office you know and that's one of the things i'll say personally that i struggled with um just for this disclosure that you know i have you know going to my doctor's office and there are parts of me that i shut down yeah. you know because i know that there is you know that that that, that homogenous dis discussion and that language and, and, and that relativity isn't there. And not to say that, you know, it can't be there, but it's just a different approach. And as you mentioned, taking one of the things you said, it just hit different. You know, yeah. it, it really yeah. it really hits different. And, yeah. and, you know, you can let your head on. And so how how would I how would a person and I just use this as a general uh, question, how would a person when they're going into a doctor's office? How would they be able to advocate for themselves? Let's say, for instance, there's a there's a there's a young brother or a black male um, who the, who is not, you know, 
um, adept in the language and being able to have that type of vernacular to talk with the doctor or the courage to do so. Mm -hmm. What were some tidbits or some suggestions you would provide in order to give them ways they could advocate for themselves when they walk into the doctor's office? So thank you for that question. I, um, I want to make a point of reference to your last statement, and then I want to kind of segue um, with that same point and kind of transition to the question you're asking now. Um, so back in 2019, I had a similar experience, um, you know, as we talked about offline, you know, black therapists and black doctors make up maybe about 5% of, you know, healthcare professionals, um, though we're about 13% of the population. And so back in 2018, I walked into a room and had a young adolescent male light up because they were just surprised to see that, you know, the, the comment was, I've never had a, seen a black doctor in real life. Like I've seen him on TV, but like never in front of me and not taking care of me. Um, and that blew my mind. That's a story that I take with me and I repeat everywhere because I was just like dumbfounded as to how that could happen. Um, having grown up around doctors and having mentors, and, and so it was absurd to me to just think that in 2018 people still have experiences like that. Um, with that being said, you know, point of reference, it's important to focus on cultural competence, cultural humility. And my patients know I talk to them regular, like this. <laughs> Um, I, it was funny, I was telling my wife the other day, like, one of the patients left, and I, the patient dapped me up. I had a patient the other day, came in to, to give a, a sample, a, you know, of something we were doing, some lab for. He's like, all right, my G. I'm like, all right, bro. Like, I will see you later. And so, you know, those kinds of things um, allow it to be more relatable. And when you're more relatable, you get information that changes treatment plans, that helps you more effectively take care of patients. Um, and so to your point of, of how to be comfortable, one, find a culturally competent physician, and they don't have to be black, though black people tend to be better. They don't have to be black as long as they are willing to have that humility to understand your culture and to understand some of the silent struggles that you go through. Um, coming in and being prepared, uh, but even before we get to prepared, understanding that if you don't vibe with your physician, you need to find a new one. The therapeutic relationship doesn't only hinge on you doing what I say because I wear a white coat. It hinges on the relationship that we have that allows you to submit your health to me as I try to guide you and usher you into a better state of health. And so if you can't submit to my leadership in that way, meaning the things I say you just don't get, we come up with a treatment plan and you don't want to follow it, um, I'm telling you to go you know, down Route A and you want to go down Route B then this therapeutic relationship is not effective and you need to go somewhere else. Doesn't necessarily mean that I'm wrong. Doesn't necessarily mean that you're right or vice versa. But it just means that this relationship is probably not the best for you to have the most optimal health outcome. Mm -hmm. Moving forward, uh, come prepared. Write your, your, uh, your information down on a booklet. Um, I have little booklets that I give out in my office because when people come in, they like to take notes. And it really tickles me that people like pull out their pen and like they pull out the smartphone and they start writing stuff down. So I got some books to hand out so they can write stuff and have stuff in their pocket. But come prepared, write things down um, so that you have your questions answered. Um, hopefully the doctor has enough time and the, you know, the fee for service, it's about a 10, 15 minute visit a lot of times. But in mm -hmm. my practice, we have about 30 to 60 minutes. So you're gonna get your questions answered. <laughs> we're gonna sit here, we're gonna have a dialogue and I'm going to focus on uh, education I'm going to focus on empowerment and teaching you concepts that you can walk away with that you don't have to run to the doctor every second, but you can start to start to maneuver and determine what are the best options for you when it comes to your health care. Um, so, you know, those are like one or two things that I would really want to harp on when it comes to, to, to finding the courage to discuss things with your physician. Um, and it's really important. You know, people come in, they're vulnerable. Um, you know, time is quick and they forget what they're going to say. And then they don't feel, you know, competent in asking questions because they're not fully educated. Um, and any physician that makes you feel less than or like you're uneducated and, and they can't explain things to you in an easy way that's easy for you to manage, then you need to get a new doctor because that doctor is not doing you, or a healthcare professional in general, is not doing you um, or is doing you a disservice. Uh, mm -hmm. Our goal and our job is to break the complicated topics down into simple language and communicate it to you so that you can move forward with that information and improve your overall health. Wow, wow. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence. This has been 
Uh, if you're listening, if you're out there viewing, we have Dr. Lawrence, Dr. Jamal Lawrence of Harvest Health MD, who is the first black owned DPC that is direct primary care office here in Savannah, Georgia. We definitely appreciate him for giving this wealth of knowledge and information and just really blowing my mind of things I've never known because I'm 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 a patient. I'm a I'm a consumer on this end. And these are things that yeah. are important to know. You know, and, and if, you, if you don't know that you don't know, then, you know, this is the time to get in, to ask your questions, to um, to 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 have those those questions answered. And so I want to take the time and just go to a few questions, if you will, Dr. Lawrence. Um, we have our, our, our question here. We're just going to post it up. Um, and our question here says, what are your thoughts on fasting, intermittent fasting, water fasting? Are there any resources or collaborators? out there that black men or women can use to research that type of journey? Um, I have a couple of thoughts on fasting. And before we get into this portion, I would just say direct uh, questions related to your specific health topic. I'm going to preface and say that you need to work those things through with your personal health care provider who understands your previous history and knows the full picture. Um, so I can't give medical advice in that sense. And nothing that I'm saying is medical advice, but merely education. With that, being said. Uh, what are my thoughts on fasting? I think fasting is effective. Um, there are studies that show that fasting actually improves uh, immunity and your ability to fight off, you know, bacteria and infection. Uh, fasting also gives the opportunity for the body to recharge and reset. Um, a lot of energy is spent in the digestive process. And so fasting gives the body time to kind of clear everything out and to work on re uh, restoration and repair. And so I think fasting in the appropriate context and approached with caution and concern is appropriate, right? And, you know, when you get to say intermittent fasting, water fasting, you know, there are different types of fasting. There's intermittent fasting, uh, which has multiple windows. And so, you know, some people will fast for 10 hours. Some people will fast for 12. Some people will fast for 16. A lot of that time fasting, that window of when you are fasting includes when you're sleeping. Um, and so just be advised seven to eight hours of that is you're sleeping. Um, there are other types of fasting like ADF, alternate day fasting. Some people eat every other day. Uh, there is OMAD, uh, one meal a day fasting, where some people eat one meal a day and that's it. Uh, I'm not telling anybody to fast because, you know, I have patients who have diabetes and, you know, fasting then becomes a little bit different when you're also taking insulin and, and how you manage those kinds of things. But I myself who don't have it, I don't have any issues with that. I will a lot of times break my fast at 12 and I will eat till maybe about six or eight and then I won't eat anything else today. So that's about two meals a day um, with whatever else I eat in between. Um, and so that's kind of how I approach it. But there are multiple ways to fast. Um, when used appropriately and guided by a medical professional can be effective at you know improving health uh, and also weight loss as well as an option. Um, but you have to do it in the proper context. Wow, thank you, thank you for that, Doc. That C, Doc, you gonna have me switching. Let me see. <laughs> You're amazing. I'm telling you, you are amazing. And uh, let's see. I, I, I want to also get ready to take a quick commercial break, and then once we get back, Doc, then we're gonna take your final thoughts and comments and, and any advice that you could give the audience. And so we're gonna go ahead and go into a 30 second break. We're gonna come back with the wheel deal, not the real deal. But it's called the wheel deal. Okay. So it's pretty much we're going to spin the wheel, ask you five questions, and okay. these are going to be random questions just for the audience to get to know another side of Dr. Lawrence. It's going to be the, the fun right. side of Dr. Lawrence. All right. So we'll be back in about 30 seconds, everyone. Thank you for tuning in and just give us about 30 seconds. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. This is the time to ask your questions right now because we're getting ready to close out the show momentarily. But before then, we're going to have Dr. Lawrence to come back for the wheel deal. I just want to make a few announcements, if you will. We are ending the Monday Monday 
Tonight, this is episode four, and we have the great, the awesome, the amazing genius mind, Dr. Jamal Lawrence. And so just with those few announcements, if you are here, if you're just watching and tuning in, please be sure to like, to share, to tag friends and men and women and all those who you know will gain great information because Dr. Lawrence is providing really good information that is applicable, that is solution focused for your life. And that's what this series is about. Solution focused methods for everyday living to help you live your lifestyle at the optimal level. In addition to that, if you have questions that you want to ask, we're asking that you not just get on, but get in, get engaged, get into the conversation, get into the discussion, give your thoughts, give your feedback, challenge us, because we want to make sure that the information that you have is solid information that's coming straight from the physician and the clinician. And so I also want to encourage you to also follow Dr. Lawrence on his Facebook page, follow him on his website. And once we get back, we're going to talk about the Black Doctors List. We're going to talk about the will deal, and then we're going to get his information based on his expert insight, what he would like to leave with you. And so, again, I'm your host, Linton Hester. This is Counseling for the Culture, also known as Council Culture, providing solution-focused methods for everyday living. And if you have not, please go ahead, scan the screen, or like and follow me on Facebook and Instagram or on YouTube, where there will be more of these shows coming to you to provide information to you to help improve your life. And lastly, go ahead and put a like in the comment. Go ahead and share and tag somebody. Let them know. And I'm giving away a t-shirt um, for those of you who are being engaged in the discussion and sharing and liking. I'm giving away a t-shirt that actually says, don't just pray for me, recommend a therapist. And so you, need, you can have Jesus and the therapist, too. You can have God and the therapist, too. So I think that is a great combination. And so without further ado, we're going to bring back to the stage our very own special guest, Dr. Jamal Lawrence. Thank you for coming back with us, Dr. Lawrence. We appreciate you for being here. Yes, sir. And so we're going to go to a few of these questions because we have some more thoughts and questions coming in sure, and sure. Um, we want to get to and I'm going to shout some of you out because I think that it, it, it is worth the shout out. So if you give me just a moment, I want to make sure that I get a chance to acknowledge you and your questions because I think that's very, very important. And so we have a question from Gene Lee Jr. His question or the question from Gene Lee, excuse me, is do you recommend juicing? Uh, thank you for that question, Mr. Lee. Uh, in terms of, yeah, so ultimately it, it kind of depends. Um, I will say what I primarily recommend is a plant-based whole food diet. And so harping on the whole food here, you know, if you're not getting any fruits and vegetables in, juicing is definitely an option. Uh, but it also depends on what you're juicing and if you have a nice uh, complementary balance to the thing that you are juicing meaning you're not just juicing a, bunch, a whole bunch of high glycemic fruits, but you're also juicing vegetables and things that will offset the, that. Um, with that being said, going back to the whole food aspect, that just essentially means eating things as close to nature as you can find them. Uh, and the reason you do that is because, so primarily that focusing on, you know, eating fruits and vegetables that, you know, are out of the ground, that are raw or slightly cooked, sauteed, um, not overly done, and because that has a better nutrition and phytonutrient profile. Uh, when, you come to, when it comes to juicing, you lose a lot of the fiber, and the fiber is what helps people manage blood sugars. The fiber is what keeps you full for longer. Uh, the fiber is what helps regulate your GI, your bowels, your uh, gastrointestinal system, your bowels. It also reduces your risk of colon cancer. And so what we don't want to do is strip the natural foods that God made and overly process them and remove some of the, the benefits of the nutrients you get than with the food that comes in its raw form. So yes, you can juice. Juicing is good, but if you can eat something whole and eat it naturally as close to nature as you can find it, I would prefer that. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great information. Doc. And so we, if you don't mind, we're going to take just a couple more questions because I know we, it's, it's lighting up in here. Um, so we have, <laughs> what effective ways 
do you suggest getting the men in our families on the same page to go into seeing the doctor, especially when they are older and may have their own stigma associated with the doctor's office? Uh, so I would, I had a, a similar question like this um, last week. And, and so my main thing is to, you can't force men to do anything. I think education and empowerment is the biggest thing. And also showing support and understanding the vulnerability of it all. And so I was actually talking to a patient recently about this. Like, and this actually brings me back to the, the last question you talked about, you know, what can men do prepared? Another thing that men can do is bring their wife. Why? Because as, as annoying as it might be to, <laughs> to sit here and have this lady talk about all the things that you might not have said and forgot, um, women are oftentimes in, in most cultures the keeper of health um, and the preserver of health in our homes and you know you're, you're one of their best investments and so it is in her best interest to keep you healthy and so if she is pointing out things to you that you're not handling at some point you want to perk up and actually take note of, of the things that she might be saying to you um, but I think it's best to appeal, uh, appeal to men and to understand where they're coming from a lot of us are providers, uh, we are protectors, we want to be respected, uh, we have a hard time being able to take off the armor. Um, and that, you know, is from personal experience, that is through the, the challenges that you go through in life, that is through encountering racism, whether it be medical or social, uh, and, and the challenges that go with your, your day-to-day -day life as a man. And so understanding where men are coming from, uh, being able to allow them to be vulnerable and not forcing the concept but continually broach, broaching it in a way that you know is i wouldn't want to say stroking their ego but understanding that it is a, already a hurdle for them to admit that they are weak in an area and need help in an area and so if you're coming from it with an angle like that uh, i think your approach is going to be a little bit different you know every man and uh and significant other whose relationship is different. So I won't tell you how to directly affect, you know, to talk to your person, but I will say the heart that, that's behind it uh, will navigate that conversation a little bit better. Um, you know, every man wants to be respected. Everyone wants to feel loved and appreciated. And if you can come from it, from that angle, I think you'll have a better um, chance at getting them to hear you and to take it seriously. And I also think sometimes men you know, I've heard this from women, men tend to listen to, to men and not to the women. And so maybe you talk to a friend and you tell them, you know, not the specifics of it, but, hey, I'm a little concerned about such and such. You know, do you have a good doctor? Do you recommend anybody? Would you talk to them about that? Because men are going to talk about those things. And that will help broach the concept that if he can't let that armor down or he doesn't want to show any kinks in the armor to you, he'll at least be vulnerable with his other friend. And that might be the spark in the change um, that can get him in and to, to, to start looking at the things that he needs to look at. That, that's great information, Doc. I, I, it's, you know, akin to um, men going to therapy. <laughs> you know, the wives yeah. actually taught the men into going to therapy because, you know, I, I like to use this term machismo. You know, <laughs> we, we yeah. want to fix it. We want to provide. We want to protect it. But, you know, at the same time, you know, we're fixing everything else. But internally, you know, we're <laughs> we're imploding or burst, bursting out the seams. And so I think that that insight that you have is, wow, is great. And then we have, may I ask, uh, we have another question coming up. Yeah. It says, uh, what, what are some practical ways you suggest transitioning to a healthier diet or plant-based lifestyle? That, that took that question right out of my mouth, Doc. Because I've been thinking about vegan, I've been thinking about yeah. <laughs> plant-based, you know, because yeah. the things are happening with the food these days. So, and, and to that question again, you know, what are some practical ways you suggest transitioning to a healthier diet such as plant-based lifestyle? I think the first way is understanding or determining your mindset behind it and why you want to make the change. Um, I'm a big believer in mindset and personal development. And so you have to understand the motivation, the motivation behind whatever you're doing. Otherwise, um, trying to find the will to do something that you're not motivated for or have shallow motivation behind 
won't necessarily get you very far. Um, so that's the first thing. Second thing I would say is surrounding yourself with in from arming yourself with information and surrounding yourself with people and environments that promote the healthier lifestyle that you want. Um, and that doesn't physically, that doesn't have to be a physical thing. Um, one of the things I used to tell my patients when they started coming into the practice and I would tell them, follow me on Instagram or follow me on Facebook. And it just so happens that, you know, on purpose, I follow certain nutrition experts, certain exercise fitness people, um, certain local organizations that promote a healthy lifestyle. And I would tell them, go through my Facebook and follow a couple of people that I follow and start commenting and liking those things. Because now you're playing with the algorithm and you're tricking mm. the algorithm into engaging with the content. So what happens when you engage with content? You see more of it. All right. Yes. And so then you, even though you might not know somebody's vegan or vegetarian, you're now starting to see this stuff coming in your timeline. Or maybe you're getting into different circles where this is kind of normal for them. Um, and being around that environment helps prompt change because like we talked about before, environment determines a lot of things. And so if you can change the environment, you can change what you're going to be exposed for, exposed to. Uh, and then I would say uh, start small. Uh, I'm a big proponent in my practice of telling people start with one or two things for six weeks or so and just see how that is. I was actually vegetarian for about three years. I recently started eating meat within the last three to four months. Um, and the way I started was just incrementally looking at my diet and seeing, you know, what can I change? All right, I'm eating rice. Is there a healthier version of rice? Then I discovered quinoa and teff and these ancient grains that have a better phytonutrient profile and better digestive profile. So I did that, cut out the white rice and just did brown rice quinoa. So like, okay, I was, I'm Caribbean, my family's Jamaican, so, you know, we eat curry, goat, and oxtail, and all these things, and when, before, I never, you know, liked seafood or anything like that, but I was like, what's the healthier version? And then I transitioned to chicken, turkey, and fish. I was doing that for a couple of years, and I was like, all right, what's the next healthier version? And I was like, okay, seafood, and so I did seafood for a little bit, until I got to vegetarianism, and so I'm at the point now where, you know, I have views on that, which we can discuss at another time. Um, but being incremental and doing it over the long course, the time is going to happen anyway. So take the time to do it and not just try to, you know, do everything at once because that usually doesn't end up going well. And then we just say, you know, I, I tried it. It didn't work. And we just move on. Wow. Wow. That is a healthy dose of information. And we have another. Oh, Wow, here we go. Okay, Doc. So we have another question. No, this is great. This is great. What What are your tips for finding a black doctor near me? And I wanted to bring that up because you yes. did something that was beyond impressive. You did something that was philanthropic, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I must say that. And that's not a hyperbole because I think yeah. it's important for individuals to know that they have, in, you know, doctors, physicians out there beyond just you know, what they see and what they know and, and, and what is out there on television land, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and to that question, what, what are your tips on finding a black doctor with uh, this this project that you've worked on and I downloaded and got <laughs> from your website? <laughs> so so what he's referring to, everyone, is um, I created, I was not created, but I guess I curated a black doctor's list uh, locally here in Savannah. Um, because of some of the things that we discussed earlier, the need for uh, the visibility of black healthcare professionals, the cultural competence of it all, people getting better healthcare when they go to people that look like them, uh, I thought it was important to find black physicians. And then when I was training as a resident, I realized it was very hard for me to find. Like, I would look around for mentorship, and I, I do have a couple of mentors who are really solid uh, in the city, but. You know, out of the two, three, and there's only one black male that I, that I found as a mentor, Dr. Bonzo Reddick, not the name drop, but that's my guy. Um, outside of him, I couldn't find people that looked like me. And so I was like, where are all the black doctors? So I went on a search and, you know, the list probably took months, um, if not that, to go over. But I thought it was really important to put, you know, all the physicians that I knew of in the area into a list. So when black patients are looking for black doctors, um, they can find them. And that's actually how a lot of patients find me. They go on Google and it's a black doctor and my, my face pops up. And so this is a list that shows you that there are more than just Dr. Lawrence and, and maybe Dr. Reddick, if you've seen him before, in the city. We have black cardiologists, we have nephrologists, we have pulmonary, um, pulmonologists, lung doctors. Um, we have psychiatrists, we have dentists, we have podiatrists. 
So there is a host of black healthcare professionals uh, in the city, and if you are interested in finding them, you can download the resource, the Black Doctors List, at harvesthealthmd.com. www.harvesthealthmd.com. It's in the resources tab, uh, educational downloads, and that will give you, you know, the list of the names, and then you can just type that in, figure out where they are uh, practicing, and go ahead and sign up to 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 join their practice if you need to. Um, that's great, great, great. I'm inspired. Dr. Well, I'm trying. I'm trying to get you to get a black therapist list going. I was going. I was going to do that, and I was like, that's not my place. So I got to do put the pressure on you. Which you know, you're inspired, Doc. The, the seed has been planted, and I've been, <laughs> I've been slowly watering it in my thoughts. I'm like, you know, I need to do this. I need to do that, and so it's happening. You you, you sparked the the you inspired it. You 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 sparked the flame, and so I'm gonna do it, Doc. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna have to follow. I'm gonna follow your greatness. <laughs> and so so yeah, that that black doctor's list is amazing because you you it, it's, it's extremely comprehensive. Not to add to anything what you said, but I went on. I downloaded the the information and i actually print printed a copy i got a copy i have i, I put this up yes doc it's that great i have a copy of it i mean i you know i don't take it lightly because you know for you to take the time to do that and to to have that information and that that shows your heart for people that that really exposes your heart for people in general just to say hey here's the help it's here for you all you have to do is just get here access it you know um, you you led them to the water. It's up to them to drink it. Now. And so you, I mean, I think you've done you're doing an amazing job, an amazing job. And so um, I think that may have concluded all of our questions. And I want to give a few shout out before we get to the wheel deal. Yep. We want to shout out Ashley Jackson. She mentions great tips, right? Ashley. Miss Ashley, also Miss Shanice Lawrence. We have Jesus and the therapist. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> we have. Queenie, she said, yes, right? <laughs> <laughs> I said that on live. It's crazy, right? But yeah, and then we have um, <clears throat> we also have uh, Miss Ashley. She says she's she she takes notes. She keeps notes. You know, <laughs> we have uh, Mr. Brian Hodge. Shout out to Brian Hodge. Thank you for being here. We we'll appreciate yeah. that. And also Miss Faith. How you doing, Miss Faith? Thank you for tuning in with us. For me. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and. Laverne. That's my mom. That's my real mom. Oh, all right. <laughs> Hi, mom. Oh, my goodness. Privilege, privilege. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. And so we, we, we're definitely appreciative to either Georgette and Theodore. We thank you all for being a part and for showing up and to being engaged. You know, it's not just about being on the show, but being engaged in the show and just asking questions that you want to know that brings valuable information to you. Um, and so without further ado, we're about to just go ahead and wrap it up, Doc. And we're going to have we're going to have the wheel deal coming out in just a moment and then we will we will conclude it so here we go all right are you able to check us out on the wheel deal so we have our questions here and it says there's just five basic questions we're going to ask oh boy i'm a little nervous so. <laughs> Can you count to ten? Mm, I don't even know. Um, I didn't think. I never took Spanish. I took Italian. Uh, I know I can't. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, ocho. No, siete, ocho, nueve, diez. I think. Oh! <laughs> you did it, Doc. You did it. <laughs> All right. Let's see what else we got. That is five. We got four more to go. See what we have. Ooh, what is one thing you can't do with that? Uh, Jesus. There we go. We have it. That's the first, final, and ultimate answer. <laughs> awesome. There we, that, that's all we need. That's all we need. <laughs> all right. Number three. Number three. Oh, this is a good one. Who was your favorite fictional superhero role? I'd probably say Superman. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was he was mine too. He was mine too. 
He was about the only one. We ain't having many many uh, superhero brothers out there. So <laughs> I had to go. <laughs> I had to go with Superman. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's see what we have. We have. Oh, okay. What is a medical show that you binge watch the most? Uh, to be honest, I don't actually watch TV. I don't. Uh, you don't. You don't, okay. don't have cable in the house. We watch. What do I watch? I might watch YouTube. I watch YouTube, all right? So it's not medical. I watch YouTube and I binge uh, business personal development podcasts. Okay, that's good stuff. That's good. I barely watch TV too. By the time I sit down, Doc, yeah. I'm like, it's watching me. I'm like, I don't enough, do cable. I can't. <laughs> and this is our last Spitfire Wheel question. Let's see what we have. Oh, okay. What is one thing? Oh, we did that one. We did that one. We did that one. I'm sorry. Let's, let's spin this one more time. No repeats. No repeats. Not for that answer, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> It just keeps doing the same thing. We're going to do one last one. I'll just pick a brand new one if you don't mind. Let's see. Give us a good one. Oh, do you know a random dad joke? Um, I don't know a random dad joke. Uh, yeah, I don't know a random dad joke. Any joke for that matter. I was going to say, I've only been a dad for about two and a half years. I don't know if I have my repertoire up yet. <laughs> Let's see. It's been seven for me and I still don't. <laughs> You have, you have two, right? Yeah. I have two twin boys, yes, sir. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, wow. Well, I don't know. I have to think about that one. You got it? All right. I um, you know, my boys have something where they say something like um, uh, what what did the what did the flower say to the seed? The flower say to the Hey, bud. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, you laugh, so I'll take that one. I'm like, I came up with that one. You laugh. But I, 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 <laughs> it's a trip. It is a trip, I'm telling you. But, Doc, we definitely appreciate it, and I want to make sure that we get a chance to allow you to leave out um, and see exactly, you know, what is it that you would want the audience to know based on your passion, based on your profession, based on all the things that – what would you like to leave with the audience and the viewers? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I guess the word to leave the audience with is to take your health seriously. Um, as I told you before, I did a keynote and kind of what I did was, you know, you look at the, the confines of health, wealth, and relationships. And I kind of made this pyramid and you know, put those in context. And for me, health was the foundation of that pyramid. Then it was relationships and then it was wealth. And a lot of times we're chasing the money or looking at who we can meet and how we can get in certain spaces. And we're neglecting the, the foundational thing that um, has impact for, you know, all other areas. And uh, when I was doing this talk, speaking particularly to black men, I was telling them or, or highlighting the point of how health impacts you um, as a man, right? And so the first thing was like, you know, you're trying to get money. You're trying to work. Well, if you have failing health, you know, you're calling out from work. You're, you're losing income. If you have failing health, you're not able to have the vitality um, in your relationships, you know, with your wife, with your children, with your, you know, friends in terms of trips and stuff like that. Um, it's more expensive to be sick. And so, you know, pay a little bit more up front for the healthier food and, and the educational piece than you have to pay on these hospital bills on the back end. Um, and so I just want to leave people, um, actually with one of quote that I said, is that I'm on a mission to change the culture around health in our culture, in the black culture. And I would like y'all to join me in doing that. Wow. Thank you, Doc. We definitely appreciate that on a mission to change the culture in black health. And you want them to join with you in doing so. That is well said, well articulated and very meaningful. And so we appreciate you, Doc. We thank you so much to the viewers out there who showed up, who supported Dr. Lawrence in his guest appearance on the show. We thank you all. We appreciate you all very much. And Dr. Lawrence, thank you. Thank you so much. I got to take you out to eat. Got to take you out to lunch or something, Doc. <laughs> <That was laughs> good, Tell me what not to eat. 
Don't eat that. Move that here. <laughs> Got to get on my good health kick. So, again, Dr. Lawrence, we have Dr. Jamal Lawrence. We appreciate everyone for tuning in. If you're listening, if you're watching, thank you so much. You can find Dr. Lawrence at HarvestHealthMD.com. Yes. He is also local as well. Anything else you would like to leave with them regarding how to locate you, location, locale, uh, Doc? Like you said, follow. Um, you can check me out on my website, www.harvest, H-A-R-V-E-S-T, health, H-E-A-L-T-H, M-D. Don't forget the M-D. Harvest Health without the M-D sends you somewhere else. Um, dot com. Or you can follow me on social, on Instagram at Harvest Health M-D. Uh, I'm also on Instagram at Jamal Lawrence MD, on LinkedIn at Jamal Lawrence MD. So, um, also on Twitter and Facebook, Jamal Lawrence MD. So follow me at any one of the socials. Uh, check out the website um, and feel free to reach out if you have any questions or um, any concerns about your health topics. I do speak locally, um, you know, as well as nationally. I'll have some stuff coming up down the pipeline, um, but I'm interested in engaging um, and, like I said, changing the culture around health. Thank you so much. And Doc, we appreciate you. We thank you so much. Stay tuned, and I will see you backstage. All right. Thank you for having me. Take care, everyone. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, everyone. We definitely appreciate you again. This is Linton Hester. We're going to be signing off. Thank you for all those who provided information, who touched bases with us, who not just chimed in, but also tuned in. And so I want to leave you with this. If there are any individuals out there who would like to be a part of the podcast show counseling for the culture please submit your information to info at livebetternow.net you can check it up at the top again it is info at livebetternow.net we're looking for individuals to come and showcase their talent provide valuable information to the show and until then i want you to stay safe stay lifted this is your host linton hester licensed professional counselor and the therapist you know. We love you. We appreciate you. Stay safe. Stay lifted. From the therapist you know. Living better now. Living better now. However, living better now. Better, better now. However, living better now. Living better now. Living, living better now. Living better now. However, living better now. Living better now. However, living better now. Better.